Bob, thank you for joining us at, at Milken. Uh, Great to be here. You made some waves on, on a panel not too long ago. Uh, public plans, public pension plans, I should say, have supported Dodd-Frank very publicly, and you came out essentially and had the complete opposite view. Well, we said so far. <laughs> It seems like it's been a net negative for shareholders, in part because of what wasn't in there. It really didn't address the competitiveness of the U.S. capital markets. I think there's a crisis going on in terms of access to capital for small, high-growth companies, which have both been the source of innovation in the United States and also the source of capital gains. And there was nothing, nothing in that bill to address capital formation. 2,133 pages, not one sentence devoted to making it easier to raise equity or to raise debt, especially for small enterprises. And if you look last year, 2010, North America's share of IPOs, in terms of proceeds raised, was 16%. It's the lowest by far on record. Compares to us having 80% market share in the 1980s and 1990s. So that's a problem. Um, I think secondly... So, so Dodd-Frank should be enacted? I think if we're going to have... But in, ad in, in addition to that, perhaps add provisions in which we yes. support access to the capital markets well, for, for yes. smaller companies. Right. Part of the context is if we're going to do a major rewrite, the most major rewrite of our financial regulatory laws and apparatus since the 1930s, you know, in 80 years, at least tackle what's the biggest forward-looking crisis, which is access to capital for growth companies, which, by the way, is one of uh, the things that the Milken Institute <laughs> focuses on. Right. Um, secondly, I mean, we all read the newspapers, we all read Bloomberg and Business Week. Um, it seems like the regulatory process so far isn't going very well. Right. This weekend, Barron's, a competitor journal, called it a fiasco. Right. Last week, there was a story that the Treasury's going to exempt uh, foreign exchange from yes. the derivatives rules. Yeah. So there was another story about two weeks ago in the Wall Street Journal saying people will have to learn an alphabet soup of new regulatory agencies just to understand Dodd-Frank, that there's going to be a whole subculture of learning how Dodd-Frank works. And again, none of it's related to capital formation. It's all related to part of what people thought the problem was. And by the way, the law doesn't even cover what, in my view, was the biggest cause of the financial crisis, okay. which was Fannie, Freddie, and the FHA, which was a policy pushed by Congress of forcing banks and forcing mortgage underwriters to lend, first of all, but to, to give mortgages to people generally with no money down, generally with minimal documentation, uh, that really couldn't afford the payments. And that was our policy. Right. And yet we had, you know, 16,000 different issues of subprime mortgages that were rated AAA. We only have a handful of companies in the United States whose debt is rated AAA. So but how really about the financial institutions that marketed uh, securities that perhaps weren't were, were, were marketed securities there's a in a way that they... issue. I mean, there's a fundamental issue. Did people understand what they were buying or not? And one half of our political system argues that the only reason this happened as if people had no idea what they were buying and they were too stupid to understand what they were buying. I don't think that's true. I think when people are offered a house with no money down at a very favorable interest rate and no recourse on those loans so that if they decide to walk from the loan, they're fine, they're perfectly rational. They took as many of those loans as they could, right, many right. people. So I, I, I think you know, the notion that the American people are too stupid I would not say this it's goes beyond the American people. Accurate. This is about securitization of those. Well, of, uh, that's of a those whole separate loans. issue. Right. Okay. Do I think it was prudent for certain financial institutions, because they were envious, frankly, of the return on equity that one of their competitors, Goldman Sachs, had been getting for a number of years? Do I think it was prudent for them to go out and not only sell CDOs and CMOs to take a fee? to actually take them on their own balance sheet and then to lever it up 30 to 1, no, that wasn't prudent. They should have lost money. They should have gone out of business. That was dumb. But I don't know if you'll correct for dumbness. This was people, you know, chasing what they thought the were going to be spectacular did, returns, though, right? I mean, but there were big risks. Government kind of did correct for that in a way. Right? In this? Well, I think, um, if anything, you might argue the government is, you know, we still have the issue of too big to fail, and one of the things the government did was to kind of resolve those entities because it was too big a risk to the financial system to let them go out of business. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that was bad. They took emergency action. They had to. 
I still think there are certain too big to fail issues that remain around us even after the passage of Dodd-Frank. For example, here at this conference, which is a discussion, uh, the five largest banks in the United States um, account for about half, just a little less, 48% of all the assets in the banking system. So there's still an issue that if those banks do stupid things and get into trouble, they're going to have to be attended to. I don't think it will, it, will, it will not be without risk to let them fail. Right. But I just go back to the issue. Here, here's, a, here's a broader issue in terms of process. Dodd-Frank was rammed through. It got three votes from Republicans in the House of Representatives. It got three votes from Senate, from Republicans in the United States mm -hmm. Senate. It was, it was rammed through in a highly partisan fashion. I think that's unhealthy for the system. I think the, the future health of America's capital markets is too important to be an entirely partisan issue. Big bills like that, if you look years ago, how did the United States win the Cold War? They had a bipartisan consensus for 50 years. I worked in the White House 20 years ago. We passed the Clean Air Act, it's a very good statute. It passed 400 to 27 in the House of Representatives. It passed 89 to 11 in the Senate. It was a product of bipartisan consensus. Mm -hmm. And so I think if you look at Dodd-Frank today, it was jammed through in a partisan fashion. There's a giant jumble with respect to new rules that have to come out. 260 major rules have to be written. Various agencies have to do 67 studies under the statute, almost 100 for the SEC alone. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to kind of pause and see what mistakes have been made and what's going to work and what isn't and, and sort of give people time to coherently address those major rules. Okay. And then thirdly, but most importantly, it doesn't even address to my mind, the biggest backward-looking crisis, mm -hmm. Fannie, Freddie, FHA loans, and it doesn't address the most important forward-looking crisis, which is access to capital for growth companies and the competitiveness of the U.S. capital markets. Okay, putting aside politics yes. and regulation, yes. what is the biggest barrier for growth companies to get capital? Today? Yeah, without, 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 the, without the argument of there's no, so much not, regulation no, that no, they can't. it's not politics. Well, it, okay. it's... it's this is bipartisan regulation, so I'm not making a partisan right. comment. I think people, and over since the mid-90s, over the course of 15 years, there have been a series of steps, some by the NASD, some by the SEC, some by the New York Attorney General, that, in the old joke, seemed like a good idea at the time. But what really happened is, decimalization of the NASDAQ, squeezed all the profit for Wall Street firms. You could argue it was good for investors because it saved investors money. But what happened is it squeezed all the profit out of market making in very small cap NASDAQ names for the big investment banks. So they did the rational thing. They stopped making a market in 40 plus percent of the names they used to make a market in. Elliot Spitzer separated research from banking, squeezed all the economics out of equity research. What happened? the banks did the rational thing. They stopped covering so many names. And so today, you have 60% of the names on the NASDAQ that have one research analyst or fewer covering them, 40% that have no research coverage. Right. And then you had Sarbanes-Oxley, which the same rules apply whether you're IBM or a young startup company with a $100 million market cap. That's not appropriate. And so it, for small issuers who wanted to come public, it proved to be very expensive. Right. A couple million dollars a year. So if you add all that up, what's happened is to come public in the United States today, for the banks to cover you or underwrite you, and also just for it to sort of be affordable, you have to be much, much bigger. In the 1990s, and I was in the broker-dealer business, I was a partner at one of the four horsemen, Robertson Stevens, our average deal size was $35 million, our average post-money market cap was $150 million. Today to come public in the United States, you need to have at least about $100 million in float and be worth, in terms of post-money market cap, four to five hundred million dollars. So there's the venture industry, there, there's a bottleneck. They can't get these young companies public. They're gonna get sold in M&A deals. I can tell you there'll be a lot less job creation if a young company that's really grown like gangbusters is bought instead of come, comes public and still finance. I mean, do you think, you know, uh, Cisco Systems would have created more jobs if they were bought by DEC in 1987? You know, I think Microsoft would have yeah. employed you know, tens of thousands of people all around the world that they've been bought by IBM in 1986. Right, no, right. Of course not. So moving from venture to its cousin, private equity, yes. um, I'm curious to get your thoughts on whether the pendulum is swung back to managers in this 
forever sort of back and forth as to who has the power in, 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 terms in terms, negotiating terms. Deal terms, exactly. yeah. I mean, uh, LP agreement terms. Yeah. Yeah, I would say it's still pretty much pretty far over on the LP side. Really? People, people want to raise money. You know, we found... Uh, We've, you know, over you time, different things Jersey like DLPs that... have gone down. The split on on uh, uh, portfolio monitoring fees and stuff like that now goes all the way to the LPs. Management fees coming down a bit. Carried interest still generally 20% for mm -hmm. the most part in most funds. In the hedge fund universe, same thing. Um, and, and yes, we have been able, we're a big investor, so we put a lot of money in both hedge funds and private equity funds. And when we do, we say, gee, we're such a big investor, you should give us a better deal. So our director of the division of investment in New Jersey put out a press release recently that said that we had saved $60 million in management fees across the portfolio. And looking forward over the next five years, it'll be over $100 million. Mm -hmm. And we're proud of that. That's good. That's good for our beneficiaries. You know, will the pendulum come back the other way? Probably. Uh, we're very pleased, actually, as private equity investors in the current quarter. And so far this fiscal year, we've had way more distributions than new capital calls. So we've had a net distribution of about a billion dollars in our alternative program. And our alternative program is up double digits, performing very well. So right. we feel good that we've diversified and this is part of our portfolio mix. Yeah. And, you know, I think some of the smarter firms, uh, my, my former firm, Carlisle Group, they've done a good job. I look at the portfolio of their fourth fund. They brought Bank United Public early this year. They brought Nielsen Public. They brought Kinder Morgan Public. Mm -hmm. Now they have uh, Allison Transmission Dunkin on Donuts. file, West on file. You know, they're really doing a good job. Stock market's pretty healthy. Mm -hmm. They're accessing it. They're, they're, you know, accessing the capital markets and giving their LPs distributions, and that's what we want. What do you make of their decision to, to potentially go public themselves? Well, I think, um, you know, there's a couple things. The founders of these firms own most of the stock. The three founders of Carlisle, I believe, own you know 60% of the stock. They are now in their 60s, early to mid 60s. Maybe they don't disclose their age. They have to if <laughs> they, they go public. <laughs> exactly. But um, you know, it's a liquidity opportunity for them. I think that's part of it. There'd be no denying that. I think they would also argue that their competitors have come public. Blackstone, of course, is a public company. BX, KKR came public by merging into its uh, subsidiary. Apollo recently came public. So they look at it and say, hey, their competitors are coming public. We need a source of permanent capital on the one hand. And also, if our competitors are going to go public and we're going to attract interesting and talented people, maybe part of their compensation, in addition to salary, in addition to carry rate interest, has to be stock options or stock. And so we're going to need that to compete. So it's probably a mix of a number of things. And frankly, there's a branding aspect to it. David Rubenstein, who, to, to his credit, I know was on your show today, has always said his goal was to build Carlisle into the global private equity brand. He wants to be the household name in, in private equity. Back when I was there, we used to say we want to be the fidelity of private equity. We used to say we want to be the Goldman Sachs of private equity. Maybe that's more controversial now. But um, he's always said he wanted to be a global brand and that there would be advantages, A, to the scale of being global and having multiple funds, but B, of just having a big brand. And I think that's true. And, and I think, you know, frankly, being a public company and all the press that comes with it and the confidence perhaps that mm -hmm. investors will have or, you know, people would have knowing you're going to be around forever. You're a publicly traded company. They can see what you're worth. It probably helps their brand and it's probably good for their business. All right. Well, thank you so much. We're looking forward to you uh, making more headlines here at the Milken Conference. Thank you. Thank Glad you. to be on Bloomberg. Thanks.